First, I'm a medical doctor, so I present to a mostly medical audience, so I always have to start with my conflicts of interest. I just have a few. But suffice it to say, this is what you get when you believe in openness and transparency, and you're also going to hear a kind of attitude from me that it's not taboo to talk about companies, uh, especially here in Silicon Valley, especially when you're trying to get your work done as an academic. But I always have to start with the, uh, with the conflicts. So uh, if you haven't heard, we're in the middle of this uh, data deluge. My favorite example is this guy collecting ones and zeros with the umbrella. This came out in 2010 at Economist magazine when they announced that humans generate two zettabytes of data uh, every year. And that was back in 2010. We're probably up to 12 zettabytes. If you forget your metric pre prefixes, uh, you see them listed here, kilo, mega, giga. Uh, now, I'll be the first to admit, most of these zettabytes of data are these YouTube videos of kittens playing with yarn and piano, right? <laughs> entertainment value, perhaps no scientific value, but there is scientific data in the zettabytes. Uh, for example, the Large Hadron Collider uh, generated petabytes of data for those scientists to find new subatomic particles. Actually, more interestingly, uh, two years ago, NASA, you know, uh, the space people, right? NASA announced that by the end of this decade, they'll have so many telescopes taking pictures of the sky that they're thinking they might generate an exabyte of data every day, every day, by the end of this decade. Now, something interesting about NASA's exabytes already they already admit they take so many pictures of the sky, there are actually not enough astronomers on this planet to look at all the pictures. And so what do you do when you have too much scientific data, not enough scientists, you open this up to citizen scientists. So you can sign up at Galaxy Zoo, you can take a test, and then you get to be the one to assign, is this a star, is this a galaxy? But it's a very telling story that when you have too much scientific data, you need a new crowd of scientists to come in to help you. And of course, that's crowdsourcing, that's citizen scientists, as we've been hearing about actually all morning. Now, actually, I was really influenced by this article that came out of Wired about uh, back in 2009. Now, Wired is not the most scientific of journals, but Chris Anderson, the editor-in-chief, announced that we have so much data that science itself is getting obsolete. Now, how do you say science is getting obsolete? That's kind of ridiculous. It's actually a scientific method. You remember in fourth grade, we're all taught this, that the scientific method is we ask a question, we go get a hypothesis, we ask a question, and then we go make measurements to answer that question, right? Question first, then gather data. But we already have the data now. 99% of the new magic is figuring out what is that killer question we really want to ask here that everyone's been dying to know the answer to. No one even realizes we can actually ask this question now. And that's feasible to answer. 99% of the work is figuring out what's the tractable question now. It's not Hadoop. It's not Cloud Compute. It's not any of that. It's figuring out what can be asked with the data in its current form. So I'm a big believer in open data. Uh, and uh, I'm just going to, we only have time to give a couple of anecdotes here. So my favorite uh, anecdote over the past few years has been to address this disease called preeclampsia, obviously well known to folks who study preterm birth. This one touched me personally, and I wanted to do something about it. It's obviously how husbands lose wives around the world. Uh, in, in the United States, the only people who've really heard of preeclampsia are those that watch Downton Abbey. One of the characters dies of eclampsia. Spoiler alert if you haven't watched the series yet. <laughs> But that's, I think, still the only reason why Americans really know about this. Of course, it touches Americans and everyone around the world. Uh, it turns out there are already four drugs in trials for uh, preeclampsia. You can see that on clinicaltrials.gov. But don't, the diagnostic we're using is still decades old. We're measuring protein in the urine. So we wanted to come up with more specific diagnostics. So using publicly available data, we started to just integrate these data sets and come up with a story. And specifically, what we're talking about is dozens of researchers generated dozens of data sets, wrote dozens of papers, but because NIH and the journals make you share that data to the public, we can integrate all that and figure out, figure out what's in common and chase those down potentially as diagnostics. And one example here is a gene called, uh, protein called hemopexin, which is higher in preeclampsia, women with preeclampsia compared to normal pregnant women who don't have preeclampsia. And we found a half a dozen of so, or so of these, and this was funded by March of Dimes and uh, CTSA seed grant money. You can see the papers linked here. And what do you do next? Well, in Silicon Valley, it's okay to start a company on that. And I know we were talking about entrepreneurship a little bit in a negative kind of light here, but I want to just make a point here that I think we do believe that we can start companies in this area of the country to change the world. If you want to change the world, we can't just keep writing papers about it. We actually have to come up with something, invent something maybe. And if no one's willing to license that and put it into practice, it's up to us to do that. And it's not taboo to talk about companies, if that's the way it's going to happen. So we launch a company. We've got $2 million in seed financing. I'm not bragging about the $2 million to this audience. Actually, it's not a lot of money for Silicon Valley. But I'm just showing you that this is now the new way science can continue out of academia. That the science now, a prospective trial, needs to happen, but it's going to be funded on private dollars 
Or to put it another way, do you know how hard it is to get a brand new $2 million NIH grant today for people? But now it's funded on private dollars, and that's the idea. Once you get the grant, once you get the paper, take it beyond and actually come up with something for patients. Where do I think things are going next? If I think about the next big open data, it's going to be clinical trials data. I think it is inexcusable that we run so many experiments in the world, whether it's pharmacological or social interventions, and then when they fail, we learn nothing about them. And that, to me, is inexcusable. And I think we need to start to share the raw data, especially if public money touches that, those trials. We should start to share that raw data so we learn from the failures, not just the successes. And I don't mean just that summary table we're going to put on clinicaltrials.gov. I mean actually the raw data. Figure out maybe this intervention worked in a select few patients. And maybe figure out how to validate that. And that might lead us to precision medicine, even from failed trials, not just the successful ones. It's inexcusable to me that we don't do this today. I think that's going to be the next big open data. But I think the next big data, and it's not necessarily going to be open right away, is going to be in the clinical data itself. I'm really proud that I was able to move to UCSF last year and really join this effort. More than six years, the University of California has been creating systems to interoperate across the five University of California medical systems. That's UCLA, UCSF, Irvine, Davis, and San Diego. Now totaling more than 14 million patients, it's about 4% of the US population, get some care in the University of California. And beyond just counting these patients now, we're actually consolidating all the record data in one place so we can improve our operational care, make sure we're not learning what works and doesn't work in medicine, and actually maybe even start to figure out what's going to happen next with our patients, our 14 to 15 million patients. I think we can do a lot with this data, but I don't think we should keep it all to ourselves. We can slice it, dice it, de-identify it, and let others do research with this too. Clinical researchers, mobile health activists, community activists, mashing this up maybe with EPA data, if you believe that EPA data now, I'm not sure anymore. Transplant patients might get their complex care or other complex chronic disease patients. Chief medical officers might want to figure out how do we actually prevent uh, readmissions uh, or practicing uh, improper care. And genomics researchers might be able to study the entire University of California as one population. What I'm trying to do with this data is actually start to build maps. Maps of death and disease, that sounds kind of morbid compared to Google Maps, for example, it takes you to nice destinations. I'm trying to figure out how Californians of all ages get diseases and die. And maybe we can do something about it. And so this is just a prototype here, but this is an example of just what we can do with 14 million patients. Moving from circles to circles or diseases to diseases, the squares are those that eventually die. This is actually real data with real prototypes. And as age increases, you can see patients moving from disease to disease, some of them dying. This is sepsis. A lot of people die of that. And I think we'll be able to start to predict what is going to happen next, not just to build nice data visualizations, but to do something about it, to come up with a way to prevent what's going to happen in the next 90 days or in the next year. The data has been sitting there. It is also inexcusable to me that we are spending hundreds of billions of dollars generating and building electronic health record systems but essentially rounding error close to zero in analyzing any of that data. I think that's the next great opportunity, taking advantage of all that data. So this is just a prototype. But to me, if we can start to predict what happens next to our patients and do something about it, that to me is going to be the new definition of an accountable care organization, one that accounts for the care of all 14 million of its patients, even between the encounters with mobile devices, wearables, and all the rest. So four big lessons in, I guess, my 20 years of what they call big data science now. Uh, and uh, we've been ta ta taught to at least, uh, we've been told to talk about our experiences, what we think should be done or what shouldn't be done. I think there is more than enough data today to impact medicine. We should not think about, we should obviously collect more data, but there's enough today to actually make a difference. We should not keep waiting. We need more people to act on that data. That data does nothing by itself unless people analyze it and actually generate changes in policy, generate uh, changes in behavior or changes in care. It's going to be data over dogma. That means the data is going to be able to tell you more than the experts. This is going to drive the ex experts nuts. They're not necessarily going to like this type of approach, but this is what the data is going to be able, uh, enabling the citizen scientists and the rest to do. I think there's going to be robust findings when you put a lot of data sets together, what I call retroactive crowdsourcing. These people have been there to help you, but they don't even realize they're helping you. They've been generating all this data uh, out on the internet. I think public and open data is already extremely high quality. 
We should not enter a narrative waiting for it to get to a certain quality and then doing something. It's already good enough now. I'm a big believer in Voltaire and the quote, of course, that uh, perfection's the enemy of the good enough. We should never wait for perfect data because it's always getting better. Sticks seem to work better than carrots to make people share. I, I'm usually an optimist, but I have to admit this, that it's much easier when NIH or funding agencies or Gates Foundation or Wellcome Trust make people share their data. The journals make you share that data. Uh, because sometimes, often, the people who use that data are not the same ones that provide the data. That's a reality today. The data scientists are typically different than the data generators. And so far, sticks seem to have worked better than carrots for making people share. But I'm, I want that. I'm hoping the world changes that way. The biggest problem, I think, is the fourth bullet here, that we just don't have enough question askers in this field. We have plenty of data. We have computational tools. I myself rent time on Amazon now. I don't even have a cluster here anymore. We have the compute power. We don't have enough data scientists to ask this question. And that's going to mean we're going to have to train at every level from high school to mid-career to higher education to career changers to think about using this data to ask important questions. I have to thank an enormous team of people who help us put that UC data center together. I can't call out all the names one by one. A long list of collaborators who have helped us with this work. And I have to thank uh, funding agencies. And I have to thank Zach, who's actually in the audience. He's already made himself known, I guess, by asking a couple of questions. My friend and mentor for life, and Sam and Keith for recruiting me to UCSF. Thank you. <laughs>